and then uh, this uh, the video and the uh, and the audio of this webinar will be uploaded on the SA Homeschoolers um, YouTube channel. Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, I'm really pleased at the attendance. It's already 94 and people are coming in all the time. So we've got a limit of 251. So I, I think that will be sufficient for the webinar. So today's uh, webinar will be about uh, the proposed home education policy. Um, it's important that this is not confused with Bella Bill. So Bella Bill is proposed new legislation, uh, but this is about the policy. So last year, um, the, the draft bill, Bella Bill, was um, published for public comment. And then shortly after that, um, the policy was also published for public comment. Um, I will go through what the difference between a bill and a policy is in the presentation. So don't worry if you don't understand that now. Okay, so the recording has started. I'm going through the presentation now. Okay, so we are talking about the new proposed policy and before I talk about that I just want to give a background of what is the background for this new policy and what was the old policy about so this is not the first policy a policy was published in 1999 about three years after home education was uh, uh, acknowledged in South African legislation in the SA Schools Act. So the SA Schools Act was promulgated in 1996 and then 1999 a policy was um, promulgated. Um, at that stage there were about, uh, this is just a, a guesstimate, about 2,000 home learners. The policy that was published was in conflict with SASA. SASA is the SA Schools Act. Uh, so a policy is supposed to be an interpretation of the Act and it gives guidance to officials in the Department of Education how to implement the Act. So if, um, if, if a policy is in conflict with an Act, then it doesn't make sense because the access you must do A, but the way that the executive interprets and implements this act is in conflict with that. So it's uh, such a policy is unenforceable. Um, and because of that, the policy was mostly ignored by the home education movement and, 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 and very little um, homeschooling parents uh, registered. And then on top of that, there was a court case called uh, known as the Harris case uh, about the admission of a girl to a private school and the, the admission policy of the government says you must be seven when you are admitted to the school and, and there were these parents that want to, want the, wanted their child to be admitted at the age of six. And then there was a court case about um, whether uh, these parents may do something that's not uh, according to the policy. And then the, the judgment of um, Judge Albizachs was policy is not binding is um, so you cannot be forced to follow the policy it's it's laws and regulations that can be enforced but not policies so so that means all the the home education policy was therefore also not binding and therefore uh, the um, policy could be lawfully ignored 
So that is what happened in 1999 and afterwards. Now we're in 2018, but um, in 2017, uh, a, a new policy was proposed. And um, at that stage, the estimate was that there were about 100,000 learners. And what happened since 1999 is that public education has dismally failed and home education is one of the few affordable alternatives to public school education. Um, private schools are generally unaffordable um, and the only really affordable to middle class and poor people as an alternative to public schools is either home education or Model C schools. And it is interesting to note that it's those two forms of education that are targeted in Bellable. So that is the background to the new policy. Now we want I want to discuss of how does policy come into being. Um, so I'm going to give a bit of an overview of the political process in our country. So we live in a country and we've got a government in this country. And this government rules its citizens by means of laws. Now, I've got these three pictures here, and these three pictures um, illustrate the three branches of government. So you've got the legislative branch, also known as parliament, on the left-hand side. So you see the, all the people talking to each other. And in the middle is what we call the executive branch of government. Those are the officials that then implement the laws of the country. So that is basically the bureaucracy that uh, it, that ensures that the laws are implemented. And then on the right hand side, you've got the judicial branch of government. So that is the court systems. So the the legislative branch of government on the left is that their function is to make laws. The executive branch of government in the middle, their function is to execute laws. And then the judicial branch of government is there to resolve disputes uh, when there is a dispute around the interpretation of the law. So let's then go a bit further. So we're talking, we've been talking about laws, we've been talking about bills. And it's important that we understand the difference. So the first item uh, is a law. A law is a, basically a system of rules that are created and enforced through government institutions to regulate our behavior. And a law achieves this by describing certain human ac actions and then associate those actions with penalties. So if you've got a law, you must always have an action and a penalty. For example, the action of murder. If you murder somebody, then there is a penalty, like, uh, like lifelong prison sentence. So that is what a law is. And through these laws, um, government tries to regulate our behavior. Okay, so that is what a law is. Then you've got a bill. A bill is basically a proposed law. Um, so somebody comes up and proposes that we must have a law to regulate something, and that is then submitted to parliament. Now, generally speaking, bills are submitted by the executive branch. So it's the Department of Education, for example, that wrote the Bella Bill and then 
they will submit it to Parliament for for their approval. So generally speaking, bills come from the executive branch of government, but there's also a thing like a private bill. So a private bill can be submitted by any member of parliament. So this is this has been the, uh, the case all along. It's in our constitution, etc. But it hasn't been uh, done a lot. So the first private bill to be um, submitted and approved by Parliament was actually by um, the Honourable Cherylyn Dudley from the ACDP that submitted a private bill and it was approved by Parliament. That was the first private bill. And if I listen, look at the news, it seems like uh, private bills are increasingly becoming popular now that uh, the other politicians have seen that it is possible to get a private bill approved. So that is a law, a bill, and a private bill. So you can see the, 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 the arrow from the bill comes from the executive because it originates in the executive and is then submitted to parliament. Then we've got a policy. A policy is created by the executive, by a government department, for example, and it provides guidelines on how to implement laws. So that means um, there cannot be a policy if there is not a law. So you cannot have uh, promulgate a policy before Parliament has promulgated a law, because what we um, we call this an um, there is the promotion of administration of justice acts, which says administrators, and that refers to to officials in the executive branch of government. Uh, need to be able to show a specific law that gives them the authority to perform an administrative action. So an official can do nothing if there is not a law that gives the official the authority to do something. So if a, a government official does something that's not stipulated in law, um, that is then an infringement of the right to um, administrative justice. Then I've here also got the political parties in here. Now political parties also have policies, so we must distinguish the policy of a political party uh, from the policy of a, a government department. So the policy of a political party is the, the thing that they promise to the voters, that when they are in parliament, they will execute that policy and use their majority in, in parliament to, to get the policy implemented. But then uh, the policy is, is essentially driven by the ideology of the party. So different parties have got different ideology. So the, some parties are mostly socialistic uh, and other are more free market, democratic. And that ideology of the party determines their policy. And then that policy will then become law through the, with the actions of those politicians that are voted into government. Okay. So in effect, the ideology is basically the will of the party. Then there's another thing we must take notice, and that is international law. International law is created by international bodies, such as the United Nations. And um, 
and then governments all over the world um, ratify uh, these uh, international uh, conventions. So there is, for example, the um, International Convention of the Rights of the Child that stipulates the rights of the child and that is also um, ratified by the South African government and then effectively becomes part of our law. Okay, I hear some background now noise. Let me try to mute again. There we go. Okay, so that's an overview of our political process as a background to what happened last year. Okay. So... What happened last year is in uh, October... A, the Bella Bill, the Bella means the Basic Education Law Amendments Act, um, was published for public comment. Um, and there was a whole campaign. Um, we launched a campaign against the Bella Bill. And those uh, comments were then submitted to the Department of Education uh, that is currently in the process of drafting a, a a draft bill. So that is point one on the slide. So, and I've, there's a number of thousand next to it. There were about a thousand letters from homeschoolers um, uh, to the Department of Education with comments ab about the Bella Bill. Now, Bella Bill contains uh, changes to the law that the SA Schools Act pertaining to home education, but it also pertains a lot of changes to the Schools Act um, pertaining to Model C schools. And there's, a, there's also been a lot of comment from, from those people on the bill. Then, about a, a few weeks later, in November 2017, uh, the Department of Education um, published a draft policy for public comment. Um, yeah, I see um, questions coming off from the screen here. So just a reminder that we capture the, the questions and we'll, we'll discuss them afterwards. Um, <coughs> so... Simultaneously, or running in parallel with a, a public comment on the bill, uh, we also had to provide comment on the policy. And there were about 750 uh, le um, letters written to the Department of Education. So I've put a few photos on here. So there's a photo on the bottom left-hand side, and that is... Um, Myself, Christopher Cordero, Shirley Ervier, and my wife Debbie on the left-hand side, and uh, another lady, I forgot her name, but she was very active in the Bellable group. Um, uh, that attended a meeting at Parliament where uh, the Department of Education briefed the Parliament Parliamentary Committee. Um, on the top right, there's a photo of Karen van Oostrum and her daughter Cornelia that submitted the um, anonymous comments uh, to the Department of Education. So they physically went. If you look closely, you'll see there's a, a little uh, pack of papers. So those are the printed anonymous uh, comments to the Bella Bill there. Okay. So that is what happened last year. So there was a policy submitted for public comment and, and, and the Bella Bill. Now, this presentation will focus on the, the policy only. We, we're not really going to discuss Bella Bill. So let's proceed. 
So what are the main problems with a home education policy? Um, the first, the, the main problem is that um, the consultation process or the public participation process that pro preceded the drafting of the uh, policy was a flawed process. So representatives from uh, the homeschooling movement were invited to meetings with the Department of Basic Education in 2014 and 2015 and there is a little video on those on both those meetings in the SA Homeschoolers um, uh, YouTube channel and you can see and, and if you lo look to those videos you see th they're very positive um, and the reason they were positive is because um, during the first meeting uh, a discussion document was created by Dr. Trevor Coombe and, and, and we had lots of problems with that discussion document. And then during the second meeting, there was a second draft of that discussion document and there were significant improvements in that document and, and you could see, um, or we, we thought that the, the Department of Education has grown a lot in their understanding of home education. But it, it seems that only Dr. Trevor Coombe grew a lot in his understanding of uh, home education and not the other officials that attended the meeting. And, and, and it was the second draft document that uh, created a very positive atmosphere. And the main suggestions in that document were, firstly, that independent research in home education must be conducted. Now, independent means it must be acceptable to the homeschooling movement as well as the department, that there are no that hidden agendas or motives. It must really be independent. And then, based on this independent um, research, a third version of the discussion document will be done and then that discussion document will be released for public comment. And only after th that document has been reviewed, uh, th the discussion document will be used as the basis to write a policy. And another co uh, recommendation from Dr. Kev Trevor Coombe was that the whole consultation process must be an engagement based on trust. Um, if it's not, uh, if the project, the participation is not, that, not of that nature, then we cannot expect a successful policy. Unfortunately, it soon became evident that um, these recommendations in the second draft document um, were going to be ignored. So soon after uh, those meetings, uh, a committee was, a working group was created that had to start writing the um, policy and there were a few uh, home education representatives part of that working group and it became clear that um, nothing of the recommendations in the second uh, draft document uh, will be implemented. There is a, there's already a predetermined outcome and they're just steamrolling the process. And um, so the home education representatives are then withdrew from that process at that stage because it was not meaningful to be part of that anymore. The other big, pro so that's the f f point one, a flawed consultation process. The second point is, um, it is a funny document to read. It, it comes with fantastic, very 
very good uh, constitutional principles are explained and then the policy um, describes uh, some practical uh, provisions that uh, must be executed and there is a huge gap between the two that they just don't match but the idea is that you've got constitutional principles and you deduce from those principles practical implications to implement the principle but there must be a logical connection between the two but in the policy there is no such connection the third thing is and I've mentioned this already is you must first have an act uh, approved by Parliament and signed by the President before you can write a policy because the policy is the guideline how to implement the act in um, in practice so for example a law will say you must register so that's that is what will, a law will say and then a policy will say well there must be a registration form and then it will tell you what must you know, the contents of that registration form those are the type of things you'll find in a policy and then the uh, but in the in the policy there is okay the policy is based on the schools act of 1996 as well as the proposed Bella bill so the policy assumes already that Bella bill which hasn't even been submitted to parliament yet will go through parliament unamended there's some background noise again okay so it um, assumes that parliament will not apply its mind and will just um, pass it as it is and then the third one is if you if you look at the policy you can see that the Department of Education views home education merely as public education at home and that is it the idea the idea is they want to transform home education as a satellite of the public school and and that is the intention of of this um, so it doesn't treat home education as the diverse form of education that it actually is okay let's go to the next slide Okay, so those are the main problems with the policy. Okay, let me mute again. Okay, now we can say a lot of people say, "Ah, oh, we don't need to uh, we don't need to worry about policy because it's not it's not legally binding." Um, so in the Harris case uh, said. Um, policy uh, cannot be enforced because it's not law but we must remember policy will guide the actions of officials and a bad policy will lead to inconsistent and unlawful behavior of officials and the officials will um, treat policy as if it's law and and they will expect that you must do what the policy says so a bad policy will lead to more conflict between parents and officials the and and if you've got more conflict then it it could potentially lead to court cases so if if an official unlawfully wants to to do you something that law doesn't stipulate it could happen that um, you have to go to court and 
and to defend that in court uh, can be expensive. So um, that is why a bad policy is it has got ne ne negative effects, and we we cannot merely ignore that. And I'll just su sum it up as um, if we've got a bad policy, it it creates space for the rule of the official. So the official in the executive branch of of government that makes up rules as he, makes creates law as as he goes. Um, but we live in a democratic society, and we live by the rule of law. So, um, so that is basically the effect of bad policy. It leads to the rule of the official. So, that is then what happened. There was been a flawed um, process of education. We sit with a bad policy, um, and. The closing date for comments was the 8th of December last year. There were 750 letters submitted to the department, and then there was radio silence. So the Pestalozzi Trust um, continued to engage with the department to, um, to see yet follow up what the progress is. So in the 21st of February, so we gave them some time to come back from holiday and settle in the, the offices and process some of the, um, the 750 letters they've received. We uh, wrote a letter to ask them, um, what is the progress? And can we have a copy of the new policy? And the, the response that we got was, and I've quoted the, the, in full on the slide, the working group captured and analyzed submissions received in a fair, just, and credible manner. The policy has been revised and prepared for tabling at HEDCOM and KIM, and finally for promulgation. So we've got a Department of Education that is amazingly efficient because to process 750 letters is quite a job. Um, so um, I'm, I'm living in Cape Town and, and I'm sure you're aware of all the drought issues here. And um, the city of Cape Town was used when they, prom uh, when they um, publish something for public comment, they get about 40 letters in general and they are sort of geared to handle about 30 to 40 letters when when public comment is given. And then there was a, a lady that started a website that empowered people to send letters to um, uh, protest against uh, the, the proposed water levies and suddenly they received 60,000 letters. And the city was just not geared to handle those volumes. Now the the Director General of um, Education that presented to, par to Parliament in November described the, um, the, the letters received from the public about Bellable as a, I forgot the word now, we can just go back. As an avalanche, his words are, the word avalanche would not describe it, the reaction that I see to Bellable. It was really uh, historical, the, the, the reaction to Bellable. And now, so after receiving, having received an avalanche of responses, they claim that they've received, they've received them analyze submissions received in a fair, just, and credible manner in a, in a time period of less than two and a half weeks. That is, as the Afrikaners say, te dik for a dalder. But anyway, okay, uh, the other thing I want to highlight here is HEDCOM and KIM. 
that's something you must be aware of. So what is HEADCOM? HEADCOM is the heads of education departments committee. So those are committees within the government and policies and and, and legislation, all kind of things must first go to HEADCOM and KEM before it can be promulgated. So HEADCOM is Heads of Education Departments Committee and it consists of the Heads of Education, the, the Director General. Okay, so firstly the Director General who shall be the Chairperson. So that's the Director General of the National Department of Education. It's also important to know that We've got a national department of education and we've got provincial departments of education. Um, and in the case of education, national and provincial are equal. So the, the national is not above uh, the provincial. So this headcom has got the director general. That, that's basically the, the person in charge of the whole Department of Education. It's not a political person, it's an administrative person. Uh, so he is not voted into that position. He is a, a um, employee of the Department of Education. And then the, the Deputy Directors General of the Department. So under the departments, the, the Director General, he's got a number of deputies. Those are also senior officials in the National Department and then the heads of the provincial education departments. So these are all officials from the legislative branch uh, that form this HEADCOM committee. Then CEM, C -E -M, is the Council of Education Minister. And that consists of the minister, the National Minister of Education, who is the chairman of CHEM, and then the Deputy Minister of Education, and then every pol a provincial political head of education. So e every province has got an MSc for uh, education. So, and then the Directorial General Meeting shall attend the meeting, and then the chairpersons of the Portfolio Committee on Education in the National Assembly. So, so this is, these are more political heads, KEM is political heads, and HEADCOM is purely the executive committee. So, that is what the department then responded with. The 8th of May, we responded again to that letter, because we were quite amazed at the speed that they could... Um, uh, process in a fair, just and credible manner uh, all the letters received and we then referred them back to the second draft document and said, but wait a minute, the second draft document said there should be independent research done, there will be a, based on the research there will be a another draft discussion document and then the policy will be based on that revised discussion document. What has happened to this um, recommendation by somebody in the Department of Education? Um, so the situation is that the new policy is not based on independent research, is not based on a finalized discussion document, and and there's been no meaningful partic uh, public participation in the creation of this policy. And we raise this concern then to Dr. Similani, who is driving the whole homeschool policy um, in a letter on, dated the 8th of May. And then we received a, a quick response. Two days later, the response was, the final draft that emerges after the public consultation process is subjected to internal DBE process leading to the promulgation and publication through Government Gazette. So he basically says there will be no more public consultation. We had our, our chance last year. It will now all be handled by internal processes. 
um, and then it will be public, publicized in the Government Gazette. Um, they did then uh, refer to, to address the issue of research. They did say that they've done some research in 2007 and 2008. So the Department of Basic Education contracted um, people to do uh, research and home education in 2007 uh, by WITS EPU, Education, uh, education Policy Unit. So WITS University did some research in 2007 and 8 and was paid for it by the Department of Education and they gave the results were given to the Department of Basic Education but the results haven't been made available to the public. Um, and then they, the department claimed that they've done their own research and then obviously they say but they have done public um, participation in 2017. So they've got a, a fairly uh, uh, their view of what cons what is independent research is a bit different from our view uh, and this raises uh, quite a number of concerns so our reaction the Pestalozzi trust reaction to that was we requested the department to provide in seven days um, a description of exactly where we stand with the policy. Um, we a stage of our where are we standing? We requested a copy of the amended policy, so we want to see how does the policy look like after they've uh, reviewed them in a fair and um, just manner in, in two and a half months. And we want a copy of the WITS research done in 2007 and 2008. Of 2007 and 2008. Uh, that was the request on the 8th of June and we gave them seven days because otherwise uh, we cannot continue, we just have to wait indefinitely. So, in the absence of any response to this letter, we would then approach the minister to request an interview with the minister to discuss our concerns about the policy. So, the 15th of June ca came and went and nothing happened. So, we have then written on the 20th of June, the Pestalozzi Trust wrote a letter to the minister and we requested a meeting to um, discuss our concerns about the policy. Um, on the 20th of June, we also sent a letter to get the details of the members of Kim and Hedcom so that we can engage with um, those people. So that is what happened. So where are we standing now? We didn't, res we didn't uh, get a response uh, on our letter uh, requesting a copy of the amended policy and the, the research that the department did. And we also didn't get a response from the officer of the minister uh, on whether a meeting is feasible or not. That's where we stand now. And we, we did get a, quite a number of responses to our request for the members of Kim and Hedcom, um, but we still haven't got an answer to our question. We've got reactions um, uh, about certain statements we made in our request, but we didn't get an answer yet. So that's where we stand now. So the, I see I see the question has been raised, what are we going to do now? 
So what we're thinking of doing is firstly to write a letter to the MEC of Education in the Western Cape. The reason why we want to approach the Western Cape first, okay, and, and when I say we want to write a letter, I mean the, the Cape Home Educators. So, um, the, because the Cape Home Educators has got a very good relationship with the um, Department of Education, uh, the official there, and the Western Cape MEC has already indicated with the whole with the promulgation of the Bella Bill that they oppose the Bella Bill, but they probably oppose they oppose all the items related to Model C schools. They haven't made any comments on home education, but at least we we oppose the same bill, and then they might also be maybe open to the idea also to oppose the home education changes to Bella Bill. And since this, uh, the concern around the bad policy is that we are um, in favor of a democratic society governed by the rule of law, and the Western Cape wants to pride itself as a province that's governed by the rule of law, uh, we might have some more success to get the, the, the support of that province. And then after that letter, we would like to have a letter write, a writing campaign to all the provincial education ministers uh, that are part of KIM. And basically the arguments or the um, points we want to raise is no policy before Parliament. That means there should be not, not be any policy before there is a law approved by Parliament. And then secondly, no policy without participations. At this stage, the public participation process was a flawed process. We want meaningful participation. So that is my last slide. Um, yeah, so I've got not much more to say. So maybe, Christopher, if you can unmute and then you can maybe read the questions and we can handle them one by one. Is that possible? Yes, yeah, sure, sure, of course. Um, <clears throat> So the first question, which relate, it relates to the ballable, you may, you, may, you may want to take this question or not at this stage, is what is the intention of the ballable? Um, yeah, I think... Uh, would you like... Um, uh, this is still a private... I think uh, I've been thinking about this a lot. So when it comes to intention, you will... If you look at a law, there, there's, uh, there's, at the beginning of the law, there is a preamble. And the preamble of the law says uh, what the intention is. Now, I can't remember what the preamble of billable says, but that is the stated intention. Um, but if you look at the intention in terms of the ideological, the ideolo ideology of the party, um, My opinion is that it's it's driven by the idea of equality, that the the ruling party wants to have equal education. They want everybody to get the same education. And it's unacceptable that homeschoolers give their children a different education to children in a public school. But those things are not in the public domain. So it's it's merely a, a opinion. Um, but if I look at all the things that happened over the years, that seems to be a driving force. Have you got any comments, Christopher? Um, no, I think I think it's very difficult to uh, it's very difficult to determine 
you know, what the intention is, other than speculating, I think you've got to look at what the, you know, what, what we tend to do is we tend to look at what are the actual provisions? What are they, what are they trying to achieve? Um, so, as we know, with homeschooling, I think the, 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 the most dangerous provisions are the ones which, and, and it's another reason why we need to consider the policy quite carefully, is that, the, is that previously the minister didn't have any authority to make regulations. One of the things that's going to happen in Bellable is that the minister, they want to give the minister power to make regulations. So that and, and regulations have um, the effect of law. So that is a very um, so that is a very sort of a, a very dangerous aspect of of the bellable. And then of course we know uh, you know and then of course we've we have put out the bellable fact sheet which gives all of the the um, the specific issues which are which we've listed things like uh, I think the biggest one now is the. Um, what, 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 what should I say? What we've actually seen emerging from, from, from a whole, na a whole, a whole spectrum, is that as you were saying, they very much want to fit homeschooling into a public schooling mode. So now they want the, they want the competent, so-called competent assessor to assess the child every year. Um, we know now that uh, uh, the latest really ridiculous thing is that emerge, emerges is that. They want an in uh, uh, that the 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 um, the child if the child needs to be when they do uh, when the child is evaluated needs to be done by an in, it needs to be done under exam conditions with an invigilator present so that's something that we've now recently seen emerging so I think the whole idea is almost that uh, I think uh, what we could say is the whole idea is they almost want. A, a school at home scenario in which what the certainly that's 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 the from, irrespective of what underlying things are what we can look at in terms of the of the bill itself is that the is that essentially they want to fit everything into their school into their school model they want us to be essentially very much like a school and Bo, Bo is an expert on computers and and as he said it's very interesting that one of the things that they're very concerned about, maybe you can you can mention this more, but is uh, they talk about they don't talk about uh, learners, they talk about uh, sites that have been registered. So they almost treat each each that they're not really interested in each child; they're interested in these so-called homeschooling sites. So that's very much the the idea is to get ev they want everything to kind of fit into their their school model. That's that, that that's that's what we see in terms but in terms of looking at the legislation. Yeah. yeah. I think it, it all boils down to yeah, the provisions of the bill and the policy are is it will give the state more control over home education and they will prescribe the contents and the manner of home education. Um, and 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 at, at the end of the day, that will achieve more equality because the children at home will then more or less receive the same as the children in a school. Okay, let's move on to the next question, Christopher. So the next question is is related. What does the policy want, or what is the policy trying to achieve? Uh, yeah, I think um, I'll have to go back to my my notes. I think the the main um, I think the policy mainly achieves exactly the same as Bellable. They want more control over education. They want to specify the curriculum you can use, and and you must assess your child and. Um, so it's it's basically let me think. They prescribe what and how you educate your child, and they want to monitor it as well. Um, so it's monitoring and control. So effectively, the state wants to control home education. So that is that is what it's about, and it, it's the same as Bella Bill. Okay. 
I think we can move to the next one if uh, makes okay, sense. Okay, sure. Let me just I just have to call it up here for some reason. <laughs> um, okay, uh, how can we fight the policy? Okay, our, our approach is we will. Yet, uh, this is the term that Christopher uses: the Swiss, uh, the the Swiss approach. We will use every opportunity to resist. Um, the policy and the Bella Bill. So that's why we are basically tracking these items as they go through the motions and try to write letters and 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 engage with officials and engage with politic uh, politicians and um, to stop this uh, to stop it. So we we will use all the. Um, Avenues that the law gives us uh, to uh, to provide inputs and comments, and um, so we, we're not going to have a, a armed resistance, but we will use um, the channels that the laws the law gives us to protest against um, these things, and, and and that is what we've always done. So um, the most efficient way we found is letter writing campaigns um, because uh, um, they have a, a letter is expresses the problems of a specific individual and they have to consider each specific individual concern uh, compared to a a petition where a lot of people just say yes we agree with one person that, that that is just viewed as one person's opinion and yes there are a lot of people agreeing with him but they don't need to consider all the um, arguments of all the people so <coughs> so we we will use in Parliament the the process of public participation and then um, and then Let's say uh, the law is is promulgated as is. Worst case scenario, they don't listen to us at all. Then we'll have to fight it in the courts. So um, when it comes to the education of children, the best interests of the child are of paramount in, uh, importance. And if let me just mute here. And if you do something that's in the best interest of your child and the state wants to stop you doing it, we we can challenge that in court. So that is why we got the Pestalozzi Trust. But we, sh we shouldn't ignore the legislative branch. We should do everything in our power to stop these uh, unconstitutional uh, provisions to become law. Because it's much more expensive to fight this in the court than to fight it in in in, in Parliament, and and then if we if we resist this thing in Parliament and write letters, and this thing ends up in court later on, then we can refer in the court case that we've we've been opposed to this right from the start, and there was a lack of public participation. And um, and they didn't listen to us. And those arguments will strengthen our case in court as well. So that's why we must resist these things everywhere in the in the legislative branch of government. And then, yet if if we cannot go there, then the last resort will always be to go to court. But we must uh, we must have the capability to go to court. Okay. Okay, I just see a, a question here. Um, Christopher, you can get the. I assume you capture these new questions as well that pop up here. Christopher, I'm tr I'm trying as they come <laughs> as they come in quick and fast and sending them to you. There's a few, but, uh, but I'll, I can send you more as we. I don't know if there's one that you want to answer. No, no. But the last one that that I had was um, was just about the Namibian constitution calls for a free education 
uh, in a free and justifiable manner, can't we do this here? Yeah, in, in general, free education, um, uh, there, there, there is no such thing as free education. Um, so education costs a lot of money. A free education means you take money in a coercive way from the population and then you give it back to them or then you give them education. Um, um, that, that, that is how free education would be. If, you, if you've got a free market and where there's no free education, then everybody will pay for his own education. But if you've got a, f a, a free market where everybody can buy his own education, you can choose what you want. But if you get free education in a socialistic environment where the government provides it so-called for free, then you cannot, then there's no choice. You will only get um, wh what the government provides you. So, uh, but if you, pro um, if you start having, let's say, subsidies or, or grants for education, so if, if homeschoolers now get um, money from the state to, uh, to do their home education, that sounds very nice, but you must always remember there will be st um, strings attached to that. So if you want free education, you will lose freedom in education. So you must choose between free education and freedom in education. Okay. Okay, Bo, I've got one question, and just if you want to, just want to look at your um, at, at your chat box. Uh, it's a slightly technical question. It is: Is there any consideration by government of the resources required to enforce the testing and assessment? Um, well, that's an easy one. Uh, there is um, when they propose a bill, they have to do a social impact study or economic and social impact study. Um, no such study has been done on home education, so they haven't. They've never considered the resources in the in the. Um, submission of the Pestalozzi Trust, we have done some estimates of what this could typically cost. Uh, but they haven't done any such um, calculations. Yeah, SIAS, yeah, no costing. SIAS is a social impact assessment study. Okay, I think Sorry, there was a... um, um, uh, the questions. The questions are running ahead of me just a little oh, bit. Uh, I've um, got the small window that I see here. So there's a question here from uh, Rulin. If the policy and bill were to pass, what time frame are we to talking at? We we um, we had a webinar with um, Cheryl Dudley um, where we discussed this. So we are in 2019 now. Um, let's say the Department of so the Department of Education is currently busy going through all the um, letters they received, and they must then issue a new version of Bella Bill and submit that to Parliament. So. If they finish that by the end of this year, it could be submitted to Parliament early next year. So that will be 2019. But there is an election in 2019. So the chances are slim that Parliament will attend to Bellable in 2019. So the, an optimistic estimate would be 2020, that the bill is submitted to Parliament and then promulgated in Parliament, let's say, by the middle or the end of 2020.
But that, that sorry, place, sorry, that is bellable. I, I just yeah. want to say the policy is, is uh, the policy if is just going through internal motions. So the policy can happen anytime. Um, if they read our letters and respond to it, it might take a, take a bit longer. But if if um, if they're very serious, like it, it can be promulgated any time. Sorry, Chris. Um, no, no, that's great. And, and I think the point of the policy is that's what's worrying us most about it. And it's why we keep asking them to tell us when this head common, the CEM are meeting. And also that's the thrust of our approach to the Western Cape is to try and get them to at least put a, a spoke in the wheel of stop of of delaying the policy, you know, for a, to another meeting, or whatever. So we have more time to respond because the policy, as as you're saying, could literally go through as soon as they've had a, as soon as they've had um, a SEM and Headcom meeting. Yeah, I think something I forgot to mention is um, the Department of Education has already uh, publish, published published. Uh, a little booklet for the officials that uh, gives them guidelines on how to handle homeschoolers. Um, so they're already assuming and they're spending money in publicizing guideline booklets for the officials uh, before the policy or uh, before the policy has been promulgated and before the Bella Bill has even been submitted to Parliament. Um, and and I think the interesting thing on that one is that they in in that booklet they are actually starting to specify subjects that they want covered, which is which is quite which is interesting. Yeah. Um, can I? So I think the next question was um, was actually from Megan, and she was asking. Uh, just jumped out here quickly. Uh, do you want individual associate? Do you want individuals and or associations and August and organisations to send feedback and inquiry letters? Well, the answer to that is very easy. Yes, I mean, as as much <laughs> as possible, um, and yeah. So if we can help you with anything, if you want pro forma letters or anything, uh, please contact us. And I think Karen is also Karen just answered to that as well or on in the chat, and she said, "The pestilats you trust will give." Guidance to our members and interested parties and associations in the letter writing campaign, feedback and particip participation by everyone, definitely, just to reinforce what you said there. Yeah, yeah she only added the exclamation mark. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, then I've got a question Can the Pestalozzi Trust engage in legal action before a dispute arises on the policy between officials and homeschoolers? Well, if, if there's a dispute between officials and, and homeschooling parents, uh, th that can escalate to courts. But courts will evaluate. Courts will evaluate. Oh, I've got an echo here. Let me just oh, got mute everybody again. Uh, and, and courts will um, evaluate. Uh, the situation in terms of current legislation. So courts cannot, uh, should not consider future legislation. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't see, uh, I cannot see any value in um, going to court but while this whole thing is in is still in process, so we um, you you only go to court when all avenues have been um, exhausted. So if 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 you come up, let's say we want to take the the Department of Education to court because they've promulgated um, a policy without yet. Um, 
public participation. Um, it, you, you have to prove that they've uh, trespassed some law um, and, and you've exhausted all avenues to address this. And then if, and then there's also the issue of, well, policy is not binding. So uh, if there's a specific thing that you've, with, where the interests of a child are um, infringed on or, or not served, uh, then you can maybe go to court. But I think court action at this stage will will have very little value. Okay, I've got now most now of the questions that I've got for you are quite technical legal questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so the question uh, from Shirley is: Can the Western Cape Education Department implement their own laws and policy if they do not agree with national legislation and policy? Yeah, I'm not. But as, as far as I can know, in in terms of the constitution. Um, provincial and national are equal and the, when there is a difference between provincial and national there is some process that's described how they must um, resolve this difference um, but, but that's all I can say I um, I wouldn't know I, I don't think so we, we've got a, a, a South African Schools Act but we've also got a, a Western Cape Schools Act. And and I don't know whether these two acts are in conflict with with each other. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I can't, cannot answer this question. So let's say the Western Cape Schools Act is in conflict with the National Act. What, what is the highest? I think they are equal and there's some process through which that conflict must be resolved. That's all I can say. Yeah, I, I think to that one, um, the, 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 there's a couple of, it is a complex, legal, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complex legal, it's a complex constitutional question, uh, as you pointed out. And it's, it's further impacted by something called the Children's Act, because in the because one of the provisions of the Children's Act is that all um, is that is that all laws that affect children must be uniform. Just must must be uniform because of course you don't want you don't want a radically different law. You don't want you you, you um, they want they want a certain uniformity of laws, particularly as they concern children. So it's it's important to get the um, so so. so Perhaps the, the simplest answer to that, that question is it's important to get the Western Cape Education Department to break ranks as soon as possible before it becomes national legislation and policy. If you can get them to do that, then it becomes, then it becomes much more difficult uh, because that is easier to, it's easier to do it that way than it is afterwards to get them to break ranks from, from, from the national policy. Yeah, I think that that is already starting to happen to a certain extent where there's been some quite controversial um, changes to the Provincial Education Act. And I haven't studied this in detail, but I, I think one of the provisions that a lot of people protest against is that they allow schools, they allow the sale of liquor at schools to um, generate funds for the school. Um, whereas I think those type of things will not be possible under Bellabel, but I'm, I'm speaking under correction here. But maybe that... The, yeah, you're quite, you obviously know a lot about liquor sales at school. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, you're, you're, you're quite correct. Actually, that is, that is one of the, that is one of the issues that's, that's, that is a big controversial issue at the moment, um, and Bellable's and and Bellable has got the has literally got to a situation where 
um, you know, that, that they've put some very, very strong restrictions on, you know, the tale of Leki, even within, uh, even within the, uh, a certain distance from the school. So it's, so that's causing, so that is causing a lot of controversy. And this issue is going to obviously begin to play out as, as we perhaps see more provinces not under the control of the national government. Yeah, yeah. I it, think the I issue is that, it, sorry, the issue in many ways hasn't come to the fore because there hasn't been a lot of, because all of the provinces have been very happy to tow, in a sense of in general, tow the line of, of, of the one ruling party. As things begin to fragment, we may see a lot more court cases. Yes, yeah. Okay. I've got one, I've got another question. Is there any form of interdict that can be applied for to deny the DBE the chance of publishing the policy prior to the finalization and promulgation of the billable? I, I can perhaps yeah. just say on that one. Yeah. It, it, it's, of course, it, it's, it's very much possible. The problem is, is, that, is that any of those kind of interdicts are urgent and is not, and, and as Boa said, we have to prove, and it's something that we're working towards, we have to prove very strong prejudice on the other party's behalf, um, not, not, necessarily to win the, not necessarily to win the interdict, which is, which is also um, important, but also to, to make sure that we win the costs for applying for the interdict, because applying for the interdict itself is very expensive. Yeah, and, and, and the other thing is that somebody must be negatively affected by this thing. So if, if they promulgate a policy and everybody ignores it, then nobody's affected. Um, yet I think it, it will only it, it it will get to court when the government enforces the policy and somebody is negatively affected. Like in the Harris case, there was parents that want their child, their six-year-old child, to be admitted to a private school, and then the Department of the, the uh, Education tried to enforce their policy, and then. Uh, that the the Harris that's where the Harris case comes comes in. So um, I, 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 I would not be very positive to to go to court with these matters um, un, unless the gov uh, yeah, the the state tries to enforce the policy on a specific family and that family is then negatively affected. I've got another question then. Uh, will it be possible to continue in our in our own way um, while disputes regarding the policy are resolved through the courts? Uh, uh, very much so. I mean, this has been happening the last thirty years. Um, there was a policy in nineteen ninety nine, and it was uh, generally ignored, and and there were no consequences. So, let's say the government issues a policy, everybody ignores it. And government doesn't attempt to enforce it, then um, uh, then that policy, be it for all practical purpose, becomes null and void. And I think that that the same applies for law as well. If 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 government consequently doesn't enforce a law, that it 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 sets a precedence that well yet the state has seen that here the law is is broken and they have consciously done nothing about it um, then I think that then it becomes irrelevant to or or difficult to to enforce it at a later stage because then you'll ask the question but why are you now trying to enforce this law but you didn't do it in the past Uh, then I've got one question, which is a bit of a statement, but how on earth will they test 100,000 unwilling households? They cannot even help the willing public with basic education. I, I don't think, 
yeah, I've got no idea. <laughs> it's, it's practically impossible. Um, so to implement Bellable, for example, which requires um, assessments and so on, um, well, it will, will, will require a whole uh, bureaucracy to, to manage the registrations and then another, and that bureaucracy must also evaluate all the assessments that are submitted to that um, bureaucracy. So currently, the department or the education budget has been reduced. Um, so uh, the the state can uh, cannot build uh, public schools at the rate it it needs to accommodate all the children. Uh, currently, children cannot even be placed in public schools. There are tens of thousands of children that cannot be placed in public schools and they don't have the money to build new schools or to fix the old schools and the pit latrines and things. So to justify additional budget to uh, monitor and register homeschoolers is going to be political very diff difficult. So uh, I personally think the chances of them enforcing this are, are slim. I think they, they will use a, they will mainly rely on intimidation. Um, so they will not, um, not do anything to enforce the policy. And they will try to make an example of a single family, prosecute a single family that hasn't registered or hasn't sent in the assessment on time and hope that the rest all um, uh, out of fear then voluntarily comply with the policy. I think that has traditionally been their approach, not to enforce it, but to make an example of a few people and hope that... Uh, uh, the rest will fall in line voluntarily. I hope that addresses the question. Yeah, I think someone just echoed your, your, your comment by saying scare tactics and intimidation, um, behavior modification and state submission seem to be the objective. So someone emphasizing yeah. just the, the scare tactics in intimidation mode. Um, here's, a, here's another controversial question. Can they stop us from using Cambridge? Oh, well, that's that's a very valid question. It, uh, well, they uh, I mean there is a provision in Bella Bill where they want to outlaw alternative metric uh, qualifications. So, um, in theory, they they can try, but I think that can be be challenged in court because um, there must be a, a valid reason for, for doing this. Um, Cambridge is a, is, a, is, a, is a qualification which is highly regarded. It's not of inferior quality. So you cannot argue that uh, because the Cambridge standards are lower than the NEC, it should be outlawed. Uh, it's going to be difficult to to prove that. Uh, so why why would you outlaw something that is of a sup superior standard? Um, I think it they can try to, but I think it can be challenged. And, and I think with Cambridge specifically, one of the key uh, one of the key requirements is that they and, and I really can't remember the the term, but but they want a kind of standard setting authority that that validates the qualification. Now, with Cambridge, they actually obviously there's the, the IEC, the, the the Cambridge itself is that authority, and that authority has a has and it's one of, that authority has a specific number, and uh, and that and as long as you kind of it's, it's almost like being registered as a school. You have to have a kind of school registration number. As long as your authority has that number internationally, it's very difficult to. It, it would be very difficult to uh, um, to. It's very difficult to then find a way around 
allowing that, allowing that authority, or, you know, make allowing that to be authoritative. But yeah. they do try, obviously, through all sorts of. They try through all sorts of different tactics, like making the, like uh, having the students can be considered as foreign students and having to pay more at university and that kind of thing. Okay. I'm looking here to see if I've missed a few questions. Uh, um, I, I think that's more or less all of the questions that I can see, Boa. And I think we are also coming up to 9.30. Yeah, I thought it's, it, it, it would be a, a nice round time to, um, I'm just also scrolling here. Okay, the, the, there's a whole, there's a little question. What do we do? What do we need? What do you need us to do next? Okay, so we will be, we will be engaging with, with uh, through mailing lists, the same type of list we used to um, distribute the invite of this webinar and Facebook. Uh, we will create a platform to do this uh, letter writing campaign and we will send you all the information and, um, and ask you to write the letters. So I think that what that's what we want um, homeschoolers to do, to write let letters. So we also want to follow the example of the website Dear Cape Town uh, that um, that makes it, it's a web-based platform that just makes it easier to, to write letters. So we, you will be informed. Okay, then it's 9.30. If there's no, no other burning questions. Uh, we, I want to thank the attendance. Uh, the attendance was as much as 140. That I think that was more than I expected. Uh, thank you for your time, and I hope it was worthwhile. Uh, the recording will be placed on uh, the SA Homeschoolers YouTube channel. So you just go to YouTube and type in SA Homeschoolers, and then you'll see the, our um, homeschooling uh, YouTube channel. Thank you very much, and have a nice evening.